How's that look? All right? That look beautiful? That's all right. I, I, I think I may very well. I might actually look into the camera. Is that all right? Yep, that's totally fine. Once I do it, but you all, if you all start snoring, I'll be distracted. So if you're going to sleep, sleep quietly. I gave my first U2000 retreat before any of you were born, back in the last century, in the Christmas retreat, I think, of 1998. And in the last 20 odd years, we've gone a lot of places with U2000. I've been up and down the country, in schoolrooms, old churches. We've been in Spain, Rome, Australia, this is the strangest, I have to admit, on a camera. I suppose it's more real, in some sense, for you younger people, that we're on a camera in virtual time. The one thing I want to say this weekend, the Christian religion is not virtual. It's real. The love of Jesus for you is real. You live in a world more than I know, where people believe that you're strange if you believe in Christ. You're strange if you go to Mass. You're odd if you pray. I remember one time with one of my nieces bringing up the story of religion, and she said to me, for God's sake, John, she said, will you get real? I want to tell you during this weekend, there's nothing more real than Jesus. There's nothing more real in his understanding of you in his love for you, in the depths of your heart. There's nothing virtual about Jesus Christ and his presence in his church and in his sacraments. So I, my invitation this week is for all of us. Let's get real, not virtual. So I want to begin by reading the sacred scriptures from St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians. And he says, For I receive from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. St. Paul there is writing to the church in Corinth, maybe 30 years after the events of that Holy Thursday night. And he's passing on to the people of Corinth the Christian belief of what happened on that Holy Thursday night. And he was a Jew, remember. And so when he uses the word remembrance, or do this in memory, it isn't anything got to do with pretend, virtual, bring to mind something that happened in the past. For the Jewish religious mind to do something in remembrance, to do something in memory, was actually to make it present. And so when the Jews celebrated, for instance, the Feast of Tabernacles, as they called it, they would build booths, tents, in their own houses. And they would live in those tents, in those houses. Reliving the experience of the Exodus. To make themselves again remember who they were as the chosen people of God, that God had taken them out of slavery in Egypt, and they were his people, and he was leading them to the promised land. And so the people of Israel remembered the Exodus, and they lived the Exodus, not as though they were people of 200 years previously, but as they are today the chosen people of God. And so when our Lord says on the night before he died for us, do this in memory of me, 
He was not saying, you know, when you gather as Christians, have a meal in memory of me and think of me. That's not what he was saying. He says, when you gather together, I am present in your midst. And I want you to make present what I am doing for you. Pope Benedict used to say, you know, that the Last Supper, when Jesus gathered his disciples together, he said he was making clear what was going to happen in the next few days. His crucifixion, his dying, his death, his glorious resurrection, that he was owning it almost intentionally. This is my body given for you. This is my blood poured out for you. It's not as if I'm going to be taken away by the Romans and I'm going to lose my freedom. As we read in St. John's Gospel, Jesus is always in charge. And so, brothers and sisters, when we as a Christian community gather to celebrate the holy sacrifice of the Mass, when we as Catholics gather to adore Jesus truly present in the Blessed Sacrament, we're not remembering back to something to happen 2,000 years ago. We are. But in that memory and through the activity of Christ gloriously risen, we are present in the events of what's happening. We call Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament the real presence, not the virtual presence, not a memorial presence. It's not as if we're thinking back it's a presence. It's a making presence. And that's what the Jews meant when they used the word like memory and remembrance within a religious context. It was about making present. And so when you and I gather as Catholics for the holy sacrifice of the Mass, we are being gathered into the presence of the Lord, the real presence. But the real presence of the Lord in what he did on Calvary, what happened at the resurrection and ascension, and what will happen in the glory of heaven. So what I want to do this evening for you is to talk about the three elevations of the Mass to help us to understand more deeply that when you go to church, that when you go to celebrate the Mass, that when you come into the presence of Jesus and the Blessed Sacrament, what's really going on? What's the true memory that we are living? And I want to do this talking about the three elevations of the Mass, using the context of the theology of St. Thomas Aquinas. I would, wouldn't I, as a Dominican? Well, the first great elevation of the Mass, of course, is the consecration. When the priest at the sacred altar, the altar itself, the symbol of Christ, because we know that in the body of Christ, he is both the altar, the priest, and the sacrifice. His body is the altar. He is the priest making the offering. And he is the sacrifice being offered. And so that's why the altar is always a blessed place for us as Catholics, to gather around the altar. Not just a table, it's an altar. Because it's Jesus, it's a memory of Jesus' offering of himself, the real offering of his real body, of his life. And so when the priest gathers at the altar and he says the words of institution, the words we've read there from St. Paul, the words to some extent that are, are some sense idealized by the church, in the words of institution. He took this bread, broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, this is my body. And then the priest takes the host and the chalice, and he offers it up. That's the first great elevation. It's us being present on Calvary. It's us being present into that act of divine love. 
the love that saves the world. That's when we're at Mass. It's not just thinking back what happened 2,000 years ago in Calvary. But in the time of God, there is no time. Because God is beyond all of our notions of time. And you and I are transported in some wonderful, mysterious, sacramental way into the presence of Jesus as he offers himself in love to the Father. Adam and Eve had said no to God. And to some extent, every time we sin, we say no to God. I want to do it my way. Well, Jesus' yes to God cancels out every no. That's what gives us great hope. Any time I've ever said no to God in my life, Jesus says yes, forgives, heals, restores. And his yes allows us to continue. And so when we are at Holy Mass and the priest lifts up that host, lifts up the chalice, we're in the presence of the yes of Jesus, the taking away of all our sins, the communion between God and earth, the communion of God in his people. Mercy is born. Forgiveness, healing. Everything flows from that moment of that elevation on the cross. And we are truly on Calvary. But not are we there in a sort of a cinematic way with the blood and the tears and the terribleness of that Good Friday. But into the very heart of what was going on. In some sense, you could say at the Mass, we're more really present at Calvary than those who were there on Good Friday. Because those there on Good Friday, all they could see was the pain, the suffering, the blood, the anger, the hatred. But what do you and I see? We see the love. The love in the heart of Jesus for his Father. The love in the heart of Jesus for each one of us. He is there the expression of of the Father's love for us and our love for the Father. And so there's a reconciliation. So in some sense, as I say, we are more really present on Calvary than those who were there on that Good Friday. Because Jesus, through the teachings of his church, has brought us into what's really going on on Calvary. Yes, there's a bloody slaughter of an innocent man, but there's the moment of salvation for the whole world when God's love has triumphed in the midst of the world's suffering. And so when you and I are there at Mass and the priest elevates the sacred host and the sacred the blood and the chalice, you and I are in memory of Jesus, truly present. And his love for us is made truly present. Not 2,000 years ago, because I wasn't alive 2,000 years ago. I don't need love for sins I did 2,000 years ago because I didn't commit sin 2,000 years ago. I need love today. I need his presence today. I need his forgiveness today. I need his yes now to take away the no's of my today. So that's why I'm at Mass. That wonderful moment of the joy of the resurrection, of the joy of the, the elevation, to be on Calvary, to be in the real presence of love. And we lift up our hearts and souls at that moment of the elevation. And we are really present. We are really and truly being loved. We are really and truly are being forgiven at that moment. How wonderful to be on Calvary, but to really know what's going on in Calvary and to make that presence present to me in my life today. And so that's the first of the great elevations, if you like, the one we're probably more used to when the priest holds up the host and the sacred chalice. But you know, Calvary isn't the end 
of the story of Jesus. Calvary isn't the end of the story of the Holy Mass. Calvary isn't the end of the story of Christianity. The second great elevation St. Thomas talks about is that the through him and with him and in him. Per ipsum et cum ipsum et in ipsum. When the priest raises up now, not the separated blood and the host, that was done at the moment of the sacrifice. At the moment of the through him, with him, in him, the priest raises up both the host and the blood. For this, St. Thomas says, is our presence in the mystery of the glory of the resurrection and the ascension. When Jesus is alive in glory, and so the priest says, through him and with him and in him, all glory and honor and power is yours, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. And we limpishly say, Amen. No, we should scream it out. Even in the life of the church, it says, this is the great Amen. Because this is the presence. We are here now in the presence of the moment of the resurrection. We are here now in the presence of the moment of the ascension. When Jesus arrives in heaven in glory, he is alive, he has overcome hatred, he has overcome death, he has overcome everything that sin and the devil could throw at him, he is now victorious. And you and I now live in the victory of Christ. Through him and with him and in him, are all glory and honor in yours, Almighty Father. Because Jesus lives, everything has changed. I've changed. I've risen with him into a new life. St. Paul says, the life I now live is the life I have hidden with Christ in God. He'll say, my real life is not the life you see round about you. My real life is the life I have hidden with Christ in God, the interior life. And in this heart, we know Jesus lives. And that's why to be a Christian is always to be filled with the power and the joy of the Holy Spirit. Not because things aren't bad, not because we live in an unreality, but we know in the depths of the reality, Jesus is risen. And he is in glory. And we can't always see how this is, the letter to the Hebrews says. We've already known that Christ is glorious in heaven. But we don't always experience it in the brokenness of our own selves and in our own world. But we, we need to learn, I think, as Christians. And I think one of the great joys for my own personal life with you 2000, it got me to praise Jesus. When I started being involved in U2000, I was an old stickleback. I always said my prayers like this. The idea that I would do this or do that or scream and roar. <laughs> verboten. But U2000 taught me how to praise Jesus. How to worship him. How to thank God. And I do think that second wonderful elevation. We need it in a broken world. Very much so. We need to learn, I think, now in the church to believe in the glory of the resurrection and ascension. Because really, to some extent, it's the same mystery. It's Jesus coming back to life in that sense, showing himself to the apostles. But he's in the glory of his Father. To some extent, the story is finished, it's a happy ending. And we Christians believe that. It's a happy ending. And we can, we can face, you and I can face any trouble in the world. Because Jesus lives. He is the Lord. The early church, that was their great prayer. Jesus is Lord. You do know, of course, it was probably the most revolutionary thing anybody could have said in the Roman Empire. Because who was Lord but the emperor? And here you have the Christian saying, Ah, uh -uh, Jesus is Lord. Kurios, the Greek for Lord. Kyrie eleison. 
Jesus is Lord. That is the heart and soul of our hope and joy. And no matter what goes on in your life, my brother or my sister, learn to say in your heart, Jesus is Lord. And to raise your hands and praise him because he is Lord. And it is through him and with him and in him are all glory given to the God our Father. And because Jesus is Lord, everything in this world, to some extent, isn't real. What we think is most real is actually most virtual. What is true and what is real is that Jesus is Lord. Oh, but you might say, hang on, Father, that's all lovely, but I go to Mass, I'm the only one under 70 there. I try to say my prayers after I come back from a night out. Is that real? Yes. Jesus is Lord. And never forget that truth. And you and I at the holy sacrifice of the Mass are transported into that truth truth at that second elevation at that fi- at that belief in the risen Jesus that belief in the glorified Jesus you know funny only recently in my own life and of prayer I've sort of got used to saying the Gloria at the mass privately because I think we need to learn particularly, say, during this time of the lockdown and all the strangeness of the world, the new normal, which isn't very normal at all, Jesus is Lord. And so throughout the whole of the lockdown and through all of this lack of reality, I call it, I've learned to say glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to people of goodwill. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. We give you thanks for your great glory, Lord God, Heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father, Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father. We need to learn in these moments how to glorify God and praise him. Yes, we feel insecure because everything that was so giving us security is taken. How can life be real if you can't go to a pub? How can life be real if you can't go to a disco? If there are such things as discos, now I don't know. How can life be real if you're not even too sure I can go to school anymore? How can it be? I can't even hug my granny. I'll tell you a funny one. I went to visit my sisters just after the lockdown, and one of them said to me, oh, I can't even hug you. I said, Stephanie... You've never hugged me, so why would you hug me now? So go away, leave me alone. I love social distancing, leave me alone. But that's not the new normality, and we shouldn't get used to it. Social distancing is, unfortunately, a necessity for the moment, but it's not real. Jesus is Lord, and we need to know that, that Jesus is Lord, and we need to glorify him and sing his praises. And so, during the Mass, we have the elevation at the consecration, when we are present in the mystery of Calvary. Then we have the elevation at the end of the Eucharistic prayer, through him, with him, in him, when, again, in some wonderful sacramental way, we are present in the mystery of the resurrection and ascension. Jesus is Lord. But then Thomas talks about the third elevation. It's when the priest turns to the people and he holds up the blessed Eucharist and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. And here at the third elevation, you and I are invited to our future for us to share fully in what Jesus has done for us in the mystery of the passion, death, resurrection, ascension. Our hope of heaven. 
St. Thomas has a wonderful prayer that we Dominicans usually say before we go to office, if we say the office in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament. O sacred banquet in which Christ is received, the memory of his passion is renewed, the soul is filled with grace, and we receive a pledge of the glory that is to be ours. You see, when we go to Mass, yes, there is the memory of Calvary, there is the memory of the glorious resurrection and ascension of the Lord. But there is also the memory, in a funny way, of the future, of heaven. Why did the Lord go through Calvary? Why is he low in glory? Because he says himself, I go now to prepare a place for you. So that when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you with me. So that where I am, you may be also. Sometimes I know if you read the, the blogs and the theological disputes, you know, is the, is the mass a sacrifice or is it a meal? Thomas Aquinas would always say, yes, it's both. Don't be fighting all the time. Yes. It is being present. It is the making present of our salvation. It is the presence and making presence of our glorification and the resurrection and ascension. And it's also the sacred meal when the Lord Jesus comes to feed me and you on our journey of life. Because the Lord knows we need him. And we can't live without him. There's no doubt, I think, one of the saddest things through this whole of this pandemic or this lockdown, whatever you call it, was we couldn't go to Holy Communion. There would have been riots if we couldn't go to Dunn's stores and get our food. And yet, so many of you couldn't be fed with the Eucharist. I don't know how you've done it because I don't think it's the way it's meant to be. Of course, the Lord knows the situation we find ourselves in. But to be received the Blessed Eucharist is essential for the well-being of your soul. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, Jesus says, you cannot have life within you. To receive Jesus in his real presence. Really and truly, the Lord Jesus coming to be with you. It's the most real moment of my every daily life. And because I'm a priest, yes, I say Mass every day. And every day throughout the lockdown, I did say Mass. Indeed, it was the only thing I did do through the lockdown. It was one thing I looked forward to every day when I woke up, when I went to the chapel and said my Mass, and had the time, in a funny way, to enter into the mystery, to take my time, no rush, and to receive Holy Communion. I don't know if I like that phrase, to receive Holy Communion. Because you enter into Holy Communion. Holy Communion isn't a thing. Holy Communion is a coming together. Isn't that what we call it? Holy, because it's God. Communione, coming together. Yes, Jesus is really and truly present in the Most Blessed Sacrament. Why? Because he said it himself at the Last Supper. This is my body. This is my blood. Now, if I was to say that over a piece of bread, you'd just say, I was losing my mind. But Jesus happens to be God. God who called everything into existence out of nothing. When he says, this is my body and this is my blood, it's real. Jesus is truly and really present in the Blessed Eucharist. Why? because he loves you and he wants to enter into a holy communion with you. 
So you have Jesus really, truly, substantially present in the Eucharist. And you have me. Of course, the problem is sometimes he's really present, but I'm not really present. I'm more worried about am I going to miss a train? What time is it? Do I really bring myself to Jesus? Is there a real coming together of him and me? Or do I just receive the Blessed Sacrament and go outside the church and never think of this moment as heaven? Because that's what it is. What is heaven? Heaven is being in the presence of God. What is Holy Communion? Being in the presence of God. This is the pledge of eternal life. This is the sacred banquet that brings us deeper and deeper now in our life into communion with Jesus. And the more we receive him in this world and the more open we are to him and the more we allow that communion to be real, my life changes. I become more real. And my relationship with Jesus becomes more real. You know, when you come to receive Holy Communion and the minister of Holy Communion says, the body of Christ. You know, I like to think myself as a priest, really, as a minister for Holy Communion, because I think my whole life should be as a priest to help you to get to know Jesus and for you to enter Holy Communion with Jesus. And so the minister says, the body of Christ. And you say, Amen. I believe. I accept. Some scripture scholars say, you know, that when the angel Gabriel came to our blessed lady and asked her to be the mother of our Lord, we say that, you know, in the sacred scriptures, it tells us that Mary said, be it done unto me according to thy word. Some people say, you know, that's sort of a Greek or a Latin interpretation of amen. That our blessed lady may just have said to the angel, amen. Now, I like to think of that at the moment of Holy Communion. That when I say amen, to some extent saying it with that openness of Mary, you understand what's really happening. Because it's the real Jesus that's coming to you. The same Jesus that came to her in her womb, physically, in that reality of the incarnation. The sacramental presence, which is the real presence of Jesus now under signs, he is coming to you. Assuredly, as he came to our blessed lady. Now, oh, that I could, as Mary, say amen. And you see, when we do open ourselves completely to Jesus in the blessed Eucharist, our lives do change. It is heaven. It is God coming to be with me. I remember many, many years ago being asked at a U2000 event, why did Jesus leave himself to us in the Blessed Eucharist? I won't tell you the whole story, but I will tell you the end of it. Because all of us need to be loved in the inside. God made us for himself. And to be loved in the inside, that ever is going on in my life, the Lord Jesus comes to me. And when he comes to me in the Blessed Eucharist, I realize it's not just my own thoughts and my own memories, but it's something I am receiving something from outside. And something from outside becomes so intimately interior in the Blessed Eucharist. It's a meeting. It's a communion. And I am loved within my life. And you are loved within your life. That's the most beautiful moment of Holy Communion. Of course, I do think, brothers and sisters, you know, we'll only understand this in heaven. Because I do believe if we understood fully what happens to us at the moment of Holy Communion, I don't know, we'd explode or something. I don't know. 
But how can I, in my own little brokenness, receive the greatness of God? It's amazing. I like to think of it, you know, as the mustard seed being planted, this tiny little thing, this sacred host being planted into my soul, the pearl of great price, whatever images are all over Scripture. It's the presence of Jesus. It's the most real presence of Jesus. And so, brothers and sisters, you know, as this weekend evolves, I want us to start taking our religion seriously. It's real. It's amazing. It's like nothing else in this world. To be in the presence of love on Calvary. To be in the presence of the glory of the resurrection and ascension. To know that Jesus is Lord. That evil doesn't have the last word. The failure is not what it's all about. And to know that you are loved in holy communion, a togetherness, To know like you, no one else knows. As the Lord Jesus speaks to you in the depths of your heart. In that intimate moment of holy communion. If only I could in some way help us all to just glory in the moment of holy communion. To receive and to enter into that which you are receiving. The love, heaven, peace, forgiveness. I want to finish this talk with a short line from St. Peter in his first letter. You did not see him, yet you love him. And still without seeing him, you are already filled with a joy so glorious that it cannot be described because you believe. And you are sure of the end to which your faith looks forward. That is the salvation of your soul. I love those lines of St. Peter. You did not see him. No, I wasn't alive 2,000 years ago. I didn't walk the streets of Galilee like Peter did. I didn't stand on Calvary as Peter did. I didn't see the empty tomb as Peter did. I wasn't there when our blessed Lord was ascended into heaven in glory. Yes, I love him. And still without seeing him in that historical sense, we are already filled with a joy so glorious that it cannot be described. So really, I suppose you could say, I've wasted my last 40 minutes because I can't describe what I'm trying to describe in. <laughs> you see, you have to know it from the inside. And that's our faith. That's why our religion is real. You know, so Pope Benedict had a wonderful, wonderful vision he used to talk about, you know, passing a cathedral, one of these great Gothic cathedrals. And you look up at the windows, and they all look dark. He said, you need to go in to the cathedral and look up. And then with the sun coming through the window, you realize the beauty. You see, it's the same to be in the church. It's the same to receive Holy Communion. You can't really understand it outside. It seems strange to people outside. But for those of us who are blessed, and we have been blessed, to go in. Those of us who have been blessed to receive the Blessed Eucharist. And to know in my heart what it's like to be loved. You can't describe it. You have to experience it. And that's our Christian faith. 
That's the real presence. It's the real, most real thing in this world is God. And the most real thing in my world is to be in God's presence. And Jesus has invited you and me to this reality. Not to a virtual reality. Not to a memory game of what happened 2,000 years ago. But he invites you and me in. He invites you and me into the holy sacrifice of the Mass. He invites you and me into, in some senses, the elevations of the Mass. To be in the presence of love and Calvary. To know the glory and the joy of the resurrection and ascension. And that Jesus is Lord. And to receive the presence of heaven. The hope of eternal joy. Which is the blessed sacrament. So this weekend we are beginning. At the high point of what it means to be a Catholic, what it means to be a believer in Jesus, what it means to be a disciple. The Lord is my strength and my song. That's our motto for this weekend. It's from the Psalms. You see, strength for the writer of the Psalmist, or the writer of the Psalm, you know, It wasn't just an attribute, strength. But think of a life of a warrior. The the Jews at the time, strength meant you had to live. Without strength, you were dead. So to say that the Lord is my strength, you're really saying, the Lord is my life. And to enter into Jesus in Holy Communion, you really understand what it means. The Lord is my strength. I am loved. He is Lord. And I have received him. And we live in Holy Communion. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, World without end, amen. Is that it? Yep. Now, I know that.